So I'm going to turn it over actually to, uh, again, they've self-deemed inside scoop. They've self-deemed themselves as the president, co-presidents of the Akil Bello uh, a fan club. And that is uh, Candace Powell Kiner and uh, Nicole Renee. So I'm turning it over to them. And again, everybody, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. Um, I, I have to say that I love the fact that we have so many people on this morning, and I really do hope that you um, join us again for uh, future College Prep Roundtable uh, monthly meetings. Um, for those of you who attended for a long time, you might remember that these monthly meetings were in person. We were sponsored by college campuses. And we had things like coffee and bagels. <laughs> now you have to bring your own. But we turned it back over to the virtual space um, to keep the meetings going, to keep the information flowing. And again, um, the Philadelphia College Prep Roundtable supports the professionals who support the students. And so that's why we bring this information to you every month that we possibly can. Um, to make sure that you are on top of your game so that young people get what they need, right? So we became a fan of Mr. Bello uh, not too long ago. He was one of our uh, featured speakers for our uh, forum that we had this past February. Um, if you missed it, stay tuned. You may be able to see some of it eventually on our website. Um, but I have to say that um, his History and his background and his professional experiences give you context for what it is that we're going to discuss today. And to be honest, what are we going to discuss today? That's also something that I want Mr. Bellow really to, uh, to pull in together. Mostly we're going to discuss higher education and assessment testing <clears throat> and the background and what's going on in the forward. Uh, but I believe that Mr. Bello has a really unique perspective. And so he does come to us from fair test, but I believe his actual history and background of his experiences give you a better context. So I'm gonna let him do that because I couldn't do justice to it in the way that he did it when we met uh, earlier in the spring about this meeting. So Mr. Bello, are you ready? I am. I, uh, I, okay. I, I think I will take the. I'll take it from there. I guess. Yes, I appreciate it. And I think if we, if you start with your experiences um, and your past employment and some of the other experiences, I think that's going to give us a really good context. All right. Um, if I can get screen sharing permission, I put some slides together because that's how I do. Good. Um, I figured I'll walk you guys through a little bit of, you know, all of this stuff. Feel free to interrupt. I have the chat up. I'm going to try to pay attention to the chat. I like interruptions, but I won't always catch it. So if somebody wants to jump in, it's a small enough group that I have no issues with that. Uh, hopefully we'll have a, a nice little conversation about how things are going. Um, all right, so let's see if we can get this rolling. Cool. All right, so, so what I, thought I'd put together today and walk through is a little bit of sort of what's going on. But background on me, I am a former mediocre test taker um, back in the 80s when I took the SAT. You know, I got a 510 and a 470. Um, I went on to get a, you know, spend 30 years doing test prep. I ran my own company. Um, I taught every single major admissions test you've ever heard of. I wrote prep materials for them. I've trained teachers for them. I went to college, as a matter of fact, I went to three colleges and got one degree. So that's high level of efficiency. I recommend that you don't suggest that to your students. Um, your students would probably do that, you know, kind of maybe the other way, go to one college, get three degrees. But I figured I'd try it the, that, you know, I figured I'd try it the other way. It didn't work out, it, it, you know, it's okay. Um, ultimately I graduated. Um, since then I've been, you know, I've been doing test prep. I've, I've been 30 years, teaching, researching, exploring, talking about, um, you know, my son says I'm an adult film star because I was in the documentary, The Test and the Art of Thinking. I also was recently in Operation Varsity Blues. 
my highest achievement is I was called hot by Trixie Mattel. And I just need, you know, y'all to be aware of that. And I have an entry in the Urban Dictionary. So I'm a highly accomplished individual. You know, I coined the phrase highly rejective college and it made it to the Urban Dictionary. So my life is now complete. Um, so, so what does all of this mean, right? I look at college admissions and higher ed access, actually really like K-16 access because through, you know, through doing test prep, one test leads to another. I started with SAT, ended up with, you know, then GRE and GMAT and LSAT and all the other tests. And there's a lot of commonalities across those things. And prepping students for tests often meant thinking about the larger system of access that those tests provide. So one of the interesting things right now is we are at a point in higher ed that I haven't seen in 30 years that I, that one, there is high level of attention on access in a way that it hasn't been to date. And so there's a lot of questioning of the systems used to provide or to enable or prevent access to education. And that's changing a lot of the things that we consider. That's changing a lot of the ways that things have been looked at. And so it's creating, I think it's a creating anxiety, especially among those who've benefited from the status quo. So part of what I think is important to think about in this moment is a lot of the messaging that we're hearing right now is really about anxiety and generally about anxiety of particular people who see their planned pathways to education, to access, you know, the, all the plotting and planning they've been doing for 12 years, test optional is gonna disrupt, right? All the planning and plotting they've been doing for, for their whole lives, all the legacy advantage that they've been counting on is in jeopardy. So there's a lot of different messages that are currently out there that we have to just be aware under the guise of anxiety, often anxiety for changes to the status quo, right? That's, that's a lot of what I find has been what we're hearing these days. And one of the things we're gonna um, sort of walk you through is a bunch of newspaper articles, because I tend to look at media a lot. Um, so one of the things, you know, one of the messages that we're hearing is, you know, uh, college applications, you know, it, it, there are a lot more college applications. Everybody's applying to college. You know, during the pandemic, it's impossible to get into college. There's surprises and monstrous wait lists and all of these messages that are currently being delivered around what college admissions currently looks like. And while it's not untrue, it is a particular framing that we have to be aware of, right? Saying there's a record number of applications and that's increasing rejections and all of that sort of stuff isn't quite true, right? The messaging around the disruption of college visits isn't quite true, especially when that messaging isn't disaggregated by race, by family income, by all of those other sort of things. Because if we just took the visits conversation that we kept hearing in the beginning of the pandemic, oh my God, how are you ever gonna make a decision about where to go to college? Nobody can visit anymore. Like, who visited before? Like how many of y'all know kids that went across the country to visit the college of their choice? How many of you know kids who just applied to the college up the street and didn't ever visit it? So I think one of the issues around a lot of the conversation is they tend to focus on the behavior of the wealthiest colleges and the wealthiest families. And especially if you're looking at things like the New York Times and the Washington Post, right? Now, that's not to fault them. They have an audience and they have to serve their audience, right? Um, it was funny because Town and Country interviewed me for something. I just kept laughing. It was like, like, I don't know what the hell to say to town and country readers, right? Just like, 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 I don't know who those people are. I don't know what their what their concerns are. I don't really care 
what their concerns are because you know what they're gonna be all right right you know you read town and country you you probably ain't gonna have too many issues so just be aware of some of the messaging and what it means now that's not to say that you know yes visits were disrupted right yes that is a thing but how much does it change the process for the students that you work with? And that's an important question, thinking about who am I working with and what does this mean for the students I work with? Um, is it relevant to them or not, right? So a lot of the messaging is essentially this, right? And I, I, mean, I just love this meme because basically all the microphones go to the highly rejective colleges. Right. They, they keep talking about, you know, the change in like Harvard's applications are up 10 million billion percent and Harvard has a negative six percent admission rate. Oh, my God, nobody can get into college, ignoring that, you know, Morgan State still admits 50, 60 percent of their applicants. Right. So so just be careful of the messages that are being delivered and who is delivering those messages and what they're focusing on. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no shade for Candace and her subscription to Town and Country. Um, so I actually like to try to quantify things. So I did a Google search within Google News for which colleges get mentioned the most. And I found it really interesting that, you know, HBCUs and I, you know, I tried, I just decided I wasn't even going to try to search individual HBCUs because I know that was going to be sad, but like the category right? Like just look at the scale of mentions, right? For all of HBCUs, 101 institutions versus, you know, several of the Ivy League schools, right? Which is eight institutions, right? Colleges that change lives, right? Almost no mentions of those. So when you hear stories of college, just be aware that College don't mean college, right? College ignores community college, ignores MSIs, ignores schools that are largely open access. And that changes the framing of the messages, right? And be aware of what that means, right? And when we think about admissions rate and we think about the stories of how difficult it is to get into college, just recognize that that's a very small subset of schools. Schools with a rejection rate of 75% or better or in case you prefer to say admissions rate, right? But really, if you admit in 25% of the kids, ain't that really just like, your, your whole work is rejecting 75% of the population that applies. So, you know, you gotta really think about kind of what's going on there. Um, and also admissions rate is a question of popularity. Baruch College in New York, ha uh, which I'm sure many people haven't heard of, has close to the same admissions rate as Barnard College, um, which is part of Columbia, right? Because Baruch, is the most popular CUNY school. So it gets all of those 70,000 seniors per year basically apply to Baruch. They don't have that many seats. Therefore, they have a fairly low admissions rate. So admissions rate is simply a judgment of popularity, not a judgment of quality, right? Uh, but those things are often conflated. So you wanna make sure that in your conversations with students and families that you try to convey some of this information, right? Um, so just be aware kind of how this is all breaking out, right? Like the vast majority of colleges admit more than half the students that apply, right? So, so there's a, you know, so the, the it's hard to get into college is a narrative that is driven by a scarcity mindset focused on a very particular subset of schools, right? It's not focused on all the colleges. You know, if we're talking about colleges in the United States, there are 7,000 things the federal government calls colleges. Right, seven thousand. Right. Um, I usually use twenty three hundred because I look at when I think colleges, I think um, it, it awards bachelor's degrees. So generally, when I'm saying college, I'm thinking about institutions that award a bachelor degree. So that number narrow it it admits first year freshmen, right? It awards bachelor's degrees and accepts federal and receives federal money. So that brings that number down to about 2,300 colleges. So when I say college, that's my universe, right? And in my head, when I say college, I also exclude the for-profits. I don't usually do that in the numbers, but I do that in my head because nothing I've heard about for-profits are good. Um, so, you know, what's a college is a real question. Um, if you want to have fun with it, look at like the iPads list one day. 
Uh, one of my favorite colleges of all times was the mortuary school in Cincinnati that had like three kids, right? Like, and that's on the same list as, you know, Morehouse and, and you know, Drexel, you know, like, like how are you gonna put the mortuary school in Cincinnati or the school in Puerto Rico where their entire website is in Spanish? I'm not saying that's not a college, but I'm but the people who are looking at the college in Puerto Rico with their entire website in Spanish, actually, I think it was the conservatory in Puerto Rico with their entire website in Spanish that was on the same list of colleges as Drexel and Swarthmore, right? And I just don't think that those are really the same type of institution and really shouldn't be compared. So just be aware that sometimes the data and what they're using to create these lists aren't what you would use to create these lists. Generally, when I'm thinking of college, I'm thinking about that, that traditional four-year undergraduate educational experience. Um, so what are the stories that come out of this, right? Um, the stories that come out of this are, you know, admissions is, is it, it's, these colleges are getting far more applications and it's somewhat true. Large public, large private schools, right? Selective schools saw a bump this last year in admissions, right? 20% for large private and large public. We've got a 14% increase in applications, right? But if you look down the rest of this, and this is data from uh, Common App. If you follow, if you're on Twitter, definitely follow Jenny Ricard from Common App. Common App's been putting out a lot of data from their system, they've improved their data management system and they've been putting out charts like this, which I love because it tells us a lot about what's happening. But also remember, Common App's only 900 colleges. If we're saying there are 2,300 colleges, Common App has less than half of them. So they're giving you more of a survey, right? Than of a true, you know, then they're not giving you data on all the schools. They're giving you kind of survey data, which we're hoping reflects all the schools, but we don't know for sure. Um, Right. Also pointing to some other things. If you look down the list, right, look at the top right line there, right, private, small, less selective schools are actually down in applications, right? So depending on the category we're talking about, right, if we look at the publics, right, publics are down 5%, right, small publics that are less selective, right? So probably those regional publics are down 5% in applications. So to say that college applications are up isn't quite a fair statement. Right. And so there's generalities that are put out there that we just have to be aware of. And it's especially important in translating this to families because families tend to hear that media message. Right. And the media often won't disaggregate the numbers carefully. So your job is to make sure you're translating these things well. Right. This was something I wrote for Forbes, um, you know, when uh, it, uh, it was, I think this was last, this was last November, right? So, you know, Florida applications early on in the process, and this changed a little bit as it got later in the application cycle, but early on in the process, Florida reported their, their application numbers were down. I want to say it was like 50% at the time, right? They recovered a little bit throughout, right? But again, to say that, you know, colleges applications are up is not quite true. Now, one of Florida's issues was they required SAT scores for really, you know, they never stopped requiring test scores during the height of the pandemic when no one can get it, when tests are being canceled left and right, right? So just be aware of the messaging, be aware of what's driving the messaging, be aware of who's driving the messaging, right? Be aware of how do you get families to stop listening to this dude, right? Um, this guy is driving a lot of what's happening in college and we got to make sure that we are not letting him control that. Anybody know who that is? Who that is? Who that is? No Sorry, idea. Just, nobody, nobody. That is the evilest guy in all of college admissions. Since 1983, he has his driven behavior. He has driven behavior because he's the one that creates the US news rankings. He's the one who's decided what's important and what is not. He is the sole person behind the US news rankings. In 1983, he decided the only thing to rank was what one college president thinks of another college. So the US News ranking started solely as a survey of college presidents saying what you think about the other ones. And that's how he ranked them, right? Which is insane. Just think about that, right? Sending stuff to college presidents across, what are they gonna say about HBCUs? What will they even know about HBCUs, right? 
And, and even when we say things like HBCU, think about that. We are categorizing 101 colleges and treating them as if they're all the same. Some of which are private, some of which are public, some of which are community college, some of which are big, some of which are small. But we don't do the same thing with, with Catholic colleges. I've never heard Catholic colleges don't give financial aid, right? But that if we're gonna say HBCUs, then we probably should say Catholic colleges as a category, right? And that's not fair either. So we just wanna be aware of kind of the messaging that happens. And here's why this dude is evil, right? The things that, so since 83, he's mutated his, his rankings and decided to measure things like outcomes, which is graduation rate and earnings and things like that and retention rate. But almost all these things are simply money, right? Like the employment of a student after they graduate is in part like women are making less than men. So women's colleges won't do as well in his rankings than co-ed colleges because women make 83 cents on the dollar. What does that have to do with the educational experience at the college, right? So he's ranking things that have almost nothing to do with education. Alumni giving, what the hell does that have to do with how well I learn engineering? So being aware and making families aware of what these things are. Student excellence is the only place in which they count student-driven factors, right? Admissions rate, test scores, things like that, even if you, if you value those things. So almost nothing here is more than a proxy for the wealth of the institution, um, except for maybe the student excellence thing. And recently they changed it to try to capture the wave of social justice. They added social mobility to their metric, but it's 5%. So full social mobility counts less than expert opinion, which is really just the reputation survey among presidents and, and provosts of other colleges. So be aware of kind of what these things mean. Student excellence actually went down. So the quality of the student as judged by test scores, right, and GPAs um, actually went down in their rankings. So just be aware of kind of what these narratives are, who's driving the narratives, and what it might mean or not mean to the people you're interested in reading, right? Graduation rates. Um, you know, a lot of places get beat up on graduation rates. Thing to pay attention to, and sort of what this graph is showing, if you, like, you don't have to read it in detail, but you look at it, the black bar is going up as we read left to right. The green bar is, is mostly heading down, right? So we have a converse, uh, uh, you know, all like, different directions in these slopes. Well, the green bar is Pell rate. The black bar is graduation rate. So as Pell rate increases, graduation rate decreases. How about that? Poor people graduate at a lower rate. Surprise, surprise. What does that have to do with the strength of the education at the institution? Not sure it has a whole lot. So just be aware of these objective measures are never actually objective. Somebody chose to value those things. Somebody chose to include those things in, in rankings. Uh, college results online, thank you, Shamik. That's actually where I got this data because the data that the graduation rate here is the six year graduation rate uh, for underrepresented minorities, right? Which is, and that's actually one of the things that's good to look at if you look at college results online, it'll disaggregate graduation rates by race, right? Because if a school, we would expect the graduation rate to be fairly equal regardless of race, right? But there are some schools that have pretty significant gaps in graduation rates by race, right? By income. So that would tell you the level of supportedness of the income of the, of the institution. And so I would wanna be aware of that, right? So I like using college results online because that gives you that data in a nice, easy way. You could also get it out of iPads, but that's a nice, happy, easy place to compare the data there. Um, you know, HBCUs get beat up. But if you think about it, HB, uh, HBCUs get often get flack in the press, in the, in the ecosystem around graduation rates. But HBCUs generally have really high Pell rates. They're admitting some of the students with the most needs in the country. Well, guess what? It, the more Pell students you admit, the more low-income students you admit, the less family resources they have to solve problems. So the more onus is put on the institution to solve the problems. Well, if your entire institution has needs, it's harder to, to serve all of them. So graduation rate is largely, as, as my friend John Bakken said, um, uh, enrollment VP at Oregon likes to say, graduation rate is an input, not an output. 
if you admit wealthy kids, guess what? They are going to graduate, right? And some colleges took that approach, you know? So just be aware of kind of what these messaging mean, you know, be aware of trying to dig into institutions when, when, when you get, when, when families are looking at institutions, when families are maybe not considering institutions, you know, what other information can you give them to help disaggregate some of these numbers? Um, some interesting stories around the graduation rate that I found really fascinating. Um, this one, which I, I, I think is a California college. Um, and then there was the one, this one here, which is a little bit harder to find, but this one at Washington Post, more relevant probably to you guys and where you are in Philly. This was a story that largely featured Morgan State. Basically what Morgan State did is they got money to pay off senior students, students who are going into their final year that had, I wanna say a tuition or a bill of less than a thousand dollars. And like they had a monstrous jump in their graduation rate by paying off a financial aid bill or a tuition bill of five thousand of a thousand dollars or less, right? So one of the things I'd love to see colleges do is when they talk retention rate, disaggregate retention rate by financial retention versus academic retention. I would bet you at these play at a lot of colleges that let's say they have a sixty percent retention rate, so forty percent of students don't come back the next year. Of that forty percent. Is it 75% that didn't do it because of tuition? Because they just couldn't afford to pay. They were academically eligible to continue, but they couldn't afford to continue. Well, that's not a real number then to say they're not retaining because it's not the fault of the institution that they don't have money, right? Now, there's obviously some issues around financial aid and endowments and all of those sort of things, but that's not a mark against the educational experience of that institution, right? And they often connect retention rate to SAT scores. But we don't, I've never seen a study that looked at retention rate versus income and financial aid, right? And, and, and bills versus academics. They want us to believe that lower SAT scores are what told us those students are not gonna retain. And I would challenge that. I would love institutions to start publishing you know, academically eligible to continue versus financially eligible to retain, right? And, I, and I've never seen that data. So just be careful again about what all these numbers mean and who is, you know, and whether they're being dug into in sort of a substantive way that looks at sort of all the angles of what's going on here. Um, so other things to think about, right? One of the nice things that have happened this year is and it's not just this year, it's, it's been happening for a while, but the, the attention to public good, social justice, who are colleges serving has led us to a lot more discussion of who, who do these institutions serve and who are they built to serve? So you see more studies of Pell rates and how institutions are serving Pell rates, uh, are serving Pell eligible students, right? Which institutions are doing a good job of serving Pell eligible students and which ones aren't? I just saw a report on a school in Virginia. I feel like it's William and Lee. Um, and I'm gonna throw William and Lee under the bus because their name is William and Lee, so we might as well. Um, but I feel like they, they're in Virginia with a large percentage of black students and they admitted like seven black students over the past three years or something crazy like that, right? So, you know, and their number of Pell students is really low as well. So one of the things that's coming out of research these days is a lot more focus on sort of the public good impact and the societal impact. Social mobility has become a phrase that didn't exist, you know, in the college sphere, or I didn't hear it in the college sphere 10 years ago, right? And I think that's worth paying attention to. This shot is from the New York Times, which published the Chetty data in a nice, happily, easily accessible manner, right? Which makes it really in, it, easy to look up institutions and basically see, you know, who are they serving? Right. Uh, Raj Chetty is a professor, some hoity toity fancy professor, um, one of the economists who's actually doing good work. Um, I find that when economists start looking at education, all kind of bad things happen. Um, those are the people who seem to me to be defending the SAT most economists who don't like you're an economist. I'm not sure what you're talking about education for. Um, very few of them seem to like look at it in a, in a substantial way. But Raj Chetty did some really good work. He was looking at the income, the, uh, the family income of students at particular institutions. So at Washington University in St. Louis, 
they have 21% of their admitted students from families that make $600,000 or more. And only 6% from the bottom 60% of the economic scale of the, of the country. That says a lot about their priorities. To me, that's admission in service of endowment, right? That's not admission in service of the public good. That's not admission in service of education. That's admission in service of endowment. They just want to ensure that they're going to admit people most likely to donate back to the institution. Right? And so it's, it's worth looking at these things. And I'm not sure what that says about the educational experience, but it does put me in mind of Anthony Jack's book, the, the Privileged Poor, right? And what's the student experience like when they go to this place, right? I had a student once who said to me, he was a, a kid from Eagle Academy in the Bronx. Um, and, I, I, and this is like 20 years ago. I still remember he went on a college visit to Wheelock College, I think it's in Boston. And he came back and said two things. One, he noticed all the expensive stuff the other students wore. And two, he had to watch 90210. Because of the type of conversations that were happening there, they were just out of his sphere of awareness and he didn't feel comfortable having those conversations. Now he's still planning to go, which was real interesting, right? He's like, these ain't my people that got way more money than me. They watching TV shows I don't watch. I'm still gonna go but I gotta, I've got to integrate myself into that, which is a really interesting social comment, right? And I think that as counselors, part of your job is to make sure that they're aware of what they're walking into, right? And I think that's part of what data like the, the, the Chetty data um, gives us, right? Is, is, is who's there? What does it mean in, you know, as an experience? I went to St. John's University in Queens for a minute. I felt like I was the only one without a car. Because at the time, it had no dorms. And to me, it felt like all the kids from Long Island just drove into Queens to that school. Everybody had a car, and I was the only one on the bus, right? And, you know, that changes your perception and changes your experience. So just making sure that students are aware of kind of what this means. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's coming out that's looking at, you know, social impact, social mobility, which schools are enabling students to move up the social scale. And I think that's probably more important than Bob Morris and U.S. News crappy rankings, right? So just be aware of kind of what, what families are relying on. Um, even the ranking that there's a, another ranking, Washington Monthly, which does a social mobility ranking, they don't actually account for it. So they look at, I want to say percentage of Pell students, but they don't actually look at numbers because like one of the schools on their list, maybe it was number two, number three, right? It, it had a really high social mobility ranking, but when you dug into the data, they admitted very few students. So the percentage looked good. So let's say they admitted seven Pell kids and they all graduated last year. So they have a hundred percent performance for Pell students, but they only admitted seven, right? So, you know, one of the things that you want to try to do with these things is, is dig into the data a little bit beyond the kind of big flashy numbers. That's what happens with, with media often they grab a nice easy number they can talk about and they talk about that number. And it often obscures the, the full research that's, that's there. Um, so I dig into this stuff a lot of different ways. You know, um, As you notice, I like talking about HBCUs. I feel like HBCUs need more shine. Uh, I was digging into where are African-American students graduating? Where are they going to graduate school from? What are the sources, the feeders? of graduate school admissions, right? All the ones with the black fist next to them are HBCUs. Notice, top of the line, no matter what graduate program we looked at, Howard was on the top. So if I have a student looking to get an MBA, we should be thinking about Howard, right? That should definitely be one of your considerations, Florida m and &M, like Xavier in, in Louisiana, right? Um, not on this list, but maybe, you know, Southern, um, I'm sure is part of that list. I know for a fact, Southern has a really robust support system for getting students into medical school. There was a few years ago where Southern was in the paper because of all the students, because that's basically the place you go for black students to go to medical school. So if you have a student who says they're a doctor and they don't, who says they want to be a doctor and they are a black student um, and you don't put a, you know, Southern University on their list to at least look at, you're not doing them a service. Right, so you should be aware of stuff like this. Um, and you know, 
are we thinking about the fake HU when when we we're recommending places to students who say they want to be a, a you know a, a lawyer, right? Because we all know Ham, uh, Hampton is 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 the real HU. I'm just saying uh, Howard is the fake HU, right, Nancy? Um, other things. Uh oh, I think we started Akira, you a war. so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we actually started a war. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's how I do. Don't I do start not best. start with me, Akil. Don't start. <laughs> don't start. Just because y'all got a vice president, don't mean y'all off of in this piece. <laughs> remember when I remember when it was Hampton Institute, not Hampton University. See, all right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> I get to start wars that I have no investment in. I didn't go to either one. So, right? I know. It's okay. I, I always call it's the other okay. one. It's okay. But other things, right? Like lots of things going down, right? So being aware of sort of what's going on in the the ecosystem, right? It's been a real good year for HBCUs. Donations over the last few years have really picked up. So how is that going to change these institutions? Right? We've seen things like um Robert Smith's donation to, to Morehouse and paying off all their loans. Right, Robert Smith has gone on to do other things. Um, Mackenzie Scott has given a whole bunch of money to, a, to institutions. Her giving was really interesting because what she did was she gave donations to drive social impact. She gave donations to not her pet project, Right, which is often what the rich folks do. They give donations to places they like where they daddy and mommy went, right? They like to give to their pet project. Mackenzie Scott gave to places that would have an impact. So she gave to a lot of HBCUs. She gave to a lot of community colleges. So what type of new programs will be put into place based on the increased giving at these places, right? And that's worth being aware of, you know, because that may, may mean new programs, new degrees, things like that are, are going to come up. Um, there is some debate as to whether Cheney was actually the first HBCU. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start any trouble here, but I'm just saying. Well, you you get ready to get kicked to the saying. curb. Oh, you get ready to really start the mess now. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm just saying. It's, it's not settled history. There <laughs> is some question. So, and, and uh, between graduates, it never will be. But that's okay. That's for y'all <laughs> outsiders. I'll let, I'll let you keep going because you are the guest today. <laughs> so one of the, you know, so all of this landscape of college admissions, right? That's, I think, where we are in the landscape of the conversation of going to college. The other pieces that I sort of didn't bring out there is the conversation of, like, should we go to college? Is it worth it? Yesterday I heard an economist who, A, was questioning the value of going to college, B was questioning canceling student loan debt, you know, and, and all of, and, and from her clearly very fancy, very nice house, right? And I always wonder about those messages because who are they benefiting? The don't go to college message, right? You're the third generation college grad. You got your kids on track to go to college and you're like, yeah, people shouldn't go to college. So just be aware of the messaging that's put out there and how it impacts the students you work with in particular. I do think some people shouldn't go to college. I'm floored that all the Varsity Blues people were scheming to get into college. Your daddy got a, a million dollars to bribe his way, to bribe your way into college. Why do you need to go to college? Just get a million dollars to the child, right? So there are certain people who don't need to go to college. You know, the, 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 the main villain of that Varsity Blues story sort of the Olivia Jade girl, right? She had a thriving business with the influencer nonsense on YouTube. Why do you need to criminal, you know, to to to, to criminalize to, to you know to cheat and lie and scheme when it's already there? So there are absolutely people who don't need to go to college, but messaging generally is not directed at them. So we should be careful of what messaging is out there and making sure that we are adding nuance and thoughtfulness, right? Should I incur $75,000 in debt per year to go to college? Probably not, right? Is the dis difference between the achievements of, you know, between my potential outcome in going to Hampton versus Harvard worth $100,000 in debt? Probably not. So these conversations need to be nuanced, but we need to be aware that 
the media gloms onto things like $300,000 in debt um, and therefore don't go to college, right? Whereas in truth, that's not actually what it is. The average student loan debt is around 40,000, I believe is the last number I've seen, right? That's the average or the median debt, right? So most people aren't walking away with 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. That's almost always grad school money, right? Or for-profit college money, right? Not just, you know, going to your public up the street, even if they do gap them a bit, right? So we want to think about kind of, uh, you know, disaggregating those messages because that's generally the message that is being conveyed in these media stories that families are probably walking into your office with and you want to be ready to, to handle those messages uh, and to disaggregate those messages as well. Akil, so, I think, I think yes. Akil, I, I just want to interrupt. I think I want to, um, to double down on that in, in relationship with specifically the media piece and specifically how the media machine, I don't have a better word for it. So, you know, people will come up with like something, something industrial complex. You could, you could do that if you want to, but the media machine and the messaging that the media machine feeds to this young generation of digital natives. And so we have this lived experience as um, uh, uh, people who have gone through the process. I'm not going to call us old, but like we've gone through the process and we have the lived in life experience. And then we have this new generation of young digital natives that's coming in with all of these social media feeds and all of these directed uh, media messages about what is valuable, what is not valuable, what they're able to attain, what they're not able to attain. And like this data is incredible. And this is why every time I kill is somewhere and I have a free moment, I'm trying to go see if I can learn something. Like I literally just pulled something from what he messaged and I just messaged it to my team at College of Eisenhower, like, hey, I'm on this thing and I just learned this. This could be helpful in our work. But just one takeaway for all of us as we continue this work across uh, uh, Philadelphia College Prep Roundtable and, and, the, and the, stu the families and the students, be thinking about how do we, how do we influence the narrative that is being fed to our young people, right? Because it, it's like, we'll take this information and be like, okay, and then we're gonna go talk to young people and we'll say, but this and this and this, and they'll come back and they're like, yeah, but no. And, and you know, cancel culture and you're ghosted and whatever. And so we just have to be really thoughtful about taking in this, this context that Akhil is sharing, which is inc incredibly valuable because it literally like turns things that we're seeing in the news, in the media on its head. But we have to be really thoughtful about how we message this uh, with our families and our communities. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, no, that's big. I actually touched on that a little bit later. I've got a couple of things to show you guys around that, but I mean, Shami brings up a huge point there, right? How do you fight against TikTok, right? I was floored to find out there's somebody who's got a huge following on TikTok, doling out college advice in 30 second tidbits, like, like that's a meaningful thing, right? And, and that's the, the challenge right now in the college space is fighting against those types of messaging. Um, so specific to sort of the SAT testing world, um, you know, what does all this mean? So the pandemic canceled all kinds of tests. That hasn't stopped, although it's lost. It's, it, it, it has lost its shine, right? Like when it first happened, SATs canceled across the country, ACTs canceled across the country. That was in every paper every second day. That's no longer in every paper all the time. But I'm sure you've all experienced it, that it's still happening. Test centers are still being closed. Schools are still closed. And as long as schools are still closed, there's still going to be last minute cancellation of test centers. So I just dug up on College Board and ACT's website, you know, what cancellations happen right now for the June test. They're 80, they're like, this is a list in New York State of canceled test centers. Like that seems like it'd be more than all the canceled, all the, all the offered test centers in New York State, right? Like that's a lot. Um, when I looked up New York for the SAT, right? I looked it up on May 3rd, right? For the May 8th test. And there are 83 results for closed test centers. So testing is still being canceled, right? The, the world of testing is also changing. You might've heard early on in the pandemic um, of, of College Board announcing things coming, ACT announcing changes coming, section retesting, super scoring, all of those sort of things, right? Pandemic puts a lot of that on its head. 
college board canceled the subject test. So subject test will no longer be offered, right? So starting June, there's not gonna be subject test. The optional essay is actually going to go away entirely from the SAT, which means I actually expect the optional essay to go away from the ACT eventually as well. I feel like ACT is just biding their time right now so that they don't look like they're copying SAT, but that's gonna drop off pretty soon too, right? So, you know, there's changes in the processes that happen periodically, right? One of the changes is ACT super scoring is, is a thing that has hit the ether. It doesn't really mean much, right? But be aware that people are, are making a thing of it. ACT, basically, we all know super scoring has existed for a while. It was essentially happening in the college office. The college was choosing to super score multiple test scores. Many of them did not do it for ACT. ACT decided they're gonna jump into the mix probably because it helps the bottom line. ACT suddenly produced research. After years of saying super scoring ain't good for the ACT, you can't do it with the ACT. That's why colleges didn't super score the ACT because ACT told them not to. Well, a couple of years ago, ACT suddenly produced research that said, nah, super scoring is good, right? Because I guess they wanted more testing. I don't know why suddenly, you know, research has miraculously changed to allow this financial benefit to ACT. So not only did they say super scoring is good, they actually said, we are going to super score for the children, right? They're going to send colleges the super score as long as the kid like signs up to say, yes, send this score and that one, they'll send the college the super score and the college would actually have to work to unsuper score it. They would have to dig into the data a little bit to find the individual test scores. So super scoring was rolled out by ACT. ACT also announced section retesting, but they rolled that back. They said they're not doing it. You don't have to read the whole thing. Just know ACT said they're not doing section retesting, which would have allowed students who took the full ACT to go in the next time and just take one of the four sections, right? That was going to have to happen on computers. So it would have been a logistical nightmare. And I never figured out how they were actually going to pull it off but they came to their senses and they're like, yeah, it's just too much mess in COVID to try to pull off. So that's actually not happening. There's also no computer testing for either the SAT or the ACT. There's no national computer center testing for the SAT or the ACT um, that's happening anytime soon. So there was, there was rumors of that going to happen. David Coleman actually said he was gonna do it, but they rolled that back because the AP computer testing was such a big stinking mess. I'm pretty sure that that scared folks off of it, right? So. Any changes that were announced pre-pandemic, you know, as the Panini started coming in, there was all these things they were planning to do that largely have been put off, right? Um, other things, sort of the big thing that's come in the testing world is the wave of test optional universities, right? And so that's what we're gonna spend a little time talking about and disaggregating what that means, right? So we should know test optional is generally referring to four years bachelor's degree granting institutions that will admit students without looking with and, and give them the option as to whether to submit test scores or not, which means the universe we're really dealing with is about 2300 colleges right so there's a lot of colleges we've left out right also as long as you're granting a bachelor degree institution, we are considering you uh, fair test puts you on the test optional list, which means there are some open access schools in there because if they grant a degree you're a college on our list and we're talking about whether you include test scores or not. All right, so just be aware of kind of what the list actually is um and what a college actually is right i think that's also what often happens in these conversations people muddle kind of their perception of what a college is and like a federal definition of a college right or the definition that i'm using of a college right um so pre-pandemic about 50 percent of colleges were test optional right when we um uh, when we rolled into you know uh the the pandemic and the pandemic really kicked off, that number spiked to about 70%, right? And a lot of those colleges did it for logistical reasons, right? No one can take the SAT, about, you know, 40% of SATs were delivered um, than a normal year. So if a college was still requiring SATs, their applications were gonna be down. So lots of colleges for logistical reasons, right? Um, became test optional for, for, for 2021. For 2022, what we're seeing is that some of schools are rolling that back. Most recently, Georgia announced that they are returning to requiring SATs. Florida never budged because Florida going to do as Florida does. We know that you know Florida man is in charge of Florida and they're going to do the crazy things. So Florida never budged. They required the SAT throughout the entire, the entire Panini. 
Um, so test optional, we're talking about test optional. There's really sort of two things that come out of test optional. There's test free, right? Which means we won't look at scores at all. You send us the score, we are putting them in the shredder. The admission reader never sees them. We don't care what's, what you do with SAT, ACT scores, right? That's test free or, or, or sometimes you hear it referred to as test blind, right? Most colleges are optional allowing the students to decide whether to submit test scores or not, okay? Um, examples of places that are test-free, all of publics in California. No public institution in California will consider SAT scores in their admissions process. Um, Caltech, which is a private in California, will not consider uh, test scores for the next four years. They came out and they announced a five-year moratorium on considering test scores, okay? Um, so, you have a range of schools across the country. I feel like that number actually might be 69 right now of colleges that will not consider test scores at all, all right? Test optional though is the vast majority of them, right? And the policies vary. So one of the things to be careful about is what does test optional mean at this particular institution that this particular student is interested in, right? That, uh, that varies a fair bit, right? So that's one of the things that makes these conversations a little bit mushier um, because there's no US educational system, right? There are 2,300 colleges with 2,300 different policies. They get to do what they want. There are very few state systems, even New York City, right? The New York City public education system has, I wanna say it's 23 campuses for SUNY, right? They don't decide things as a unit. Like there are several SUNY campuses that have been test optional for years. And there are others that just became test optional because of the pandemic. Whereas in California, they're deciding things as an entire system. So UCLA and UC Merced are making the same decision. Well, that doesn't happen across the country, right? So one of the problems with the higher ed system is that it's often difficult to figure out What's driving decisions? Does the campus system, does the, the SUNY system require the, all the same thing at all the campuses? So as counselors, your job is to be aware of the colleges your students want to apply to, right? And know a lot of the policies there, right? So that you're, you help them disaggregate or research that so that they understand how those things are particularly playing out, right? Um, there are often exceptions to test optional policies. A lot of times it's honors programs. Sometimes it's for a specific group, homeschools, international students, things like that. Um, often it's for scholarships and merit aid. So when I'm thinking test optional, if I were a counselor, right? When I'm thinking test optional, I'm really thinking each of these categories. Are they test optional for admissions? Are they test optional for honors? Are they test optional for money? Right, and, be, and you wanna make sure that you know the answer on each of those tracks because the answer can be different. Okay, um, more sort of history. The first sort of official test optional policy, um, which is sort of only pseudo official because back in the 70s, you know, I think in 1960, only about 400 colleges required the SAT. So the SAT isn't really universal. It has never been universal to college admissions. There are colleges that have always been open access, right? So, but the first sort of official rejection of the test, the official test, optional declaration was in 1968, and I believe it was Bowdoin College. Um, it, mostly small liberal art, Eastern colleges, um, Northeast colleges through you know the early 2000s were schools with test optional policies. We had 280 in the early 2000s, right? That number started to go up a bit. So test optional has a long history and it's been growing. In 2013, Benedict uh, Bennington College, um, whose president at the time was Elizabeth Coleman, David Coleman's mama, um, decided to take her college test optional, which is my favorite thing in all of higher ed. The president of the college board, his mama took a college test optional. That is my favorite thing in all the world. As somebody made a t-shirt and was passing them out at NACA, that, that also made me happy. Um, more recently, at the height of things during the pandemic, um, about 1,600 colleges were test optional. That number has dipped a little bit this year. We're back down about 2,400. Now, part of the re uh, 1,400, part of the reason that number has dipped is some schools haven't announced their policies yet. Um, we don't know what the SUNY system in New York City is doing for next year. So some of this dip is simply unknown, 
places that had announced a one year temporary suspension of test requirements and have not yet updated that as to whether they're going to do another year or whether they're going to, you know, stop. So be aware of sort of like some of these places, if I have contacts in the admissions office, I'm just going to pester them. I'm going to like set up a automatic email that goes out every Monday. Yo, y'all made an announcement. Who should I touch base with? Yo, can we talk to the provost? Like send an email to the provost and the president because because it's ridiculous that places haven't made an announcement entering the summer before applications need to go out, right? But there are a lot of things that are involved in that. Sometimes it's politics, right? Especially for public systems. Public systems, they have to make decisions beyond the campus. A private school generally makes decisions on campus, right? They have the president, the provost, and the board involved. But a public system, president, provost, board, maybe the legislature. In Colorado right now, there's a bill in the legislature trying to be passed to let Colorado pub, uh, public colleges be test optional for another year. Right? Um, in New York State, there is a bill that is in committee to have New York State follow California and become test blind. So there's a lot of sort of, you know, so sometimes, you know, so, so don't beat up the colleges when these things are slow, especially the public colleges, because often it's political, right? Um, and that's sort of what's driving it. But historically, test optional has been at small schools, uh, private liberal arts schools. That has changed over the past few years, both pre-Panini and post-Panini, right? Um, we have seen a wave of public schools. Basically, right now, anywhere on the West Coast of the United States, any of the West Coast states, you if you're applying to a public college, you do not have to submit a test score. California, um, and this this came, uh, this came, was the second year that this happened, right? Washington State just did it for all their public colleges. And Washington State was really interesting because they went like almost test-free, but I feel like politics stopped them. They have a, they like their announcement, which I have in here somewhere, I'll show it to you in a second, was essentially like, we ain't really gonna consider test scores but we can't say test free because somebody ain't letting us. So it was really an interesting announcement that they did there. Um, so just be aware, right? Of like different places, different rules, different motivations for, you know, for these policies. University of Denver went test optional right before the pandemic. And that's one of the things that I would look at when you're trying to judge how, you know, how test optional are they? How serious are they about the test option? What are they really looking at? I understand that there's a lot of ambiguity in trying to mitigate and play, you know, and, and navigate the anxiety or play the probabilities of what's my probability of getting in. I think that's what drives a lot of the panic in higher ed. People trying to judge probability, right? What's my probability of admission to this place versus that place? Test optional makes that somewhat less certain. Right? That changes those percentages. When you thought you knew pretty much what was going to happen at University of Denver, and then they say optional looking at test scores or not, that changes the calculus. That makes those Navion sp scatter plots less useful. Well, I'm not sure how useful those scatter plots were to begin with. And yes, this makes that somewhat less useful. And if you're not 100% certain that they're legitimate about it, like Georgetown, I don't believe you at all. Ain't no way, no how that Georgetown legitimately don't want scores. Anybody who's ever sent a student to Georgetown and look at their requirements, they wanted three subject tests when nobody else in the world wanted subject tests, right? Georgetown said that you got to send all your test scores from the time you were a baby in your mama's womb. They wanted your APGAR score at Georgetown, right? So yeah, I don't believe Georgetown's test optional legitimately, right? So it does take a little bit of disaggregating and and for schools you are really focused on where lots of students apply to, look at their announcements. That will often show you what they're doing. When did that announcement happen? What did they say in that announcement, right? That'll often tell you kind of the, that'll give you some clues into how serious the office is about that. Um, Denver announced before the pandemic. Um, so that's a clear indicator of they weren't driven by logistics. They were driven more so by, you know, uh, a philosophical stance. Right, Wooster's been test optional forever, right? Um, and their announcements is supported by research, right? The research shows us that the value of a test to predicting succeed success or first year GPA is fairly minimal. If you take you know a fifty three percent correlation to freshman GPA, and you have somebody spend 
all that time, all that effort, all your Saturdays proctoring tests, right? For them to go from 53% to 56%, that's insane. So the value isn't there. And many institutions are realizing that, right? Many institutions are sort of being more honest about how they have evaluated. I loved Rhodes' announcement. Rhodes told us straight up that, you know, once you hit a certain number, we really didn't care. Because once you hit a certain number, we were pretty sure that you were going to do well. And their data bore it out, right? Basically, you look at Rhodes' scores, right? Above a 24, they're pretty much admitting all the folks, right? Above a 24 on the test, but below a 24, so, so no. So pretty much they drew a line. They're like, yo, this is our number and we're good. And I thought that was really interesting because like when they went test optional, that was fairly transparent about how their process worked in their office, right? So lots of research out there. And one of the things that you wanna be aware of are these conversations, you know, what's the value of tests? What's the meaning of tests? I think those who worship at the altar of tests want us to equate testing performance with academic performance and graduation rates and career success, like college readiness, career readiness are somehow measured by test scores, right? And I think that that is a, that's an overuse of test scores. It's an overreach, right? And, and it's an overreach that benefits the testing industry more so than anybody else. And there's lots of research that shows us the predictive validity of test isn't worth the weight it's given in the process, right? For 2% bump on graduation rates at most places and even less at HBCUs, why are we using these tests, right? That's giving you almost nothing. And there's lots of research to support that. There's a, the, the most recent study, this last one here, um, looks at a wider range of schools and it's show, you know, what they looked at was the bump to diversity from test optional policies. Um, if you look at the kind of third line of that first summary, a three to 4% bump in Pell recipients. That's worth going test optional, right? Uh, so schools are looking at this, right? You know, you wanna be aware of this. And, and one of the problems actually with some of this, there was a recent article based on that same study that showed the three to 4% bump in enrollment of Pell students from test optional policy. That reporter pulled a different stat from that same study that said a 1% increase in diversity. So that reporter found the least beneficial statistic to cite from that study. So one of the things that you wanna look at when this research comes out or when people are talking about stuff is make sure that you kind of look at different readers of the research or read the research yourself, right? But it's fair to say test optional will never be enough. There are far too many things in this process that impact who gets into college and why that changing the testing requirement by itself ain't gonna do that, right? Because if we look across all these things, you know, okay, sure, killing one of them will certainly help, right? I can't see how crossing one of these lines out won't help somewhat. It ain't gonna solve the problem Then those who pretend that test optional is supposed to be a solution are lying. No one's ever made that claim, but largely colleges are doing it in order to remove a barrier that's fairly easy to remove. It is hard to disaggregate who gets access to APs and who doesn't. It is easy to say, you can choose whether to send test scores or not. So that's one of the things that drives some of these test optional decisions, right? Um, to Shamik's point, right? Be aware of the messaging that is being transmitted to your students and to you, right? Um, there was a big hoopla when colleges were going test optional about, you know, is test optional really test optional? NACAC had to pub had to get people to sign on to a to a document to say, yes, we really test optional is test optional, right? But when you think about who's questioning college policies, right? You know, this is America, so everything comes down to dollars, right? When you look across, like, who are the people questioning it? Oh, it's all the test prep folks. All the people like test prep, uh, the test publishers are questioning whether test optional has value. The test prep companies are questioning whether test optional has value and many of the independent college counselors. All the people who have a financial interest in selling you secret sauce, in selling you that only they have the solution to what college you should go to. So be aware of who's delivering these messages. This was an article that floored me. It was in the Daily Pennsylvanian, right? And they interviewed this dude, right? I looked at this dude's website and the comments he had. So he gave his, what was it like? 
like his prototypical stories of how they work their magic to get people in college. And the stories he put front and center on his website was basically these people's race kept them out of college and we fixed it, right? And these are quotes from his website. What's also fun, the same dude who was quoted as an ex excerpt as an expert in this Pennsylvania in this UPenn article has sued his client because he didn't think the client would pay the balance of the $1.5 million they paid for college counseling to get them into an Ivy League school. I'm not sure this is the dude I would trust to look at the system and tell me how it's working. All right, this is the dude with a very particular point of view who is framing the discussion so that he can charge the rates he charges. And so be very careful because for newspapers, it's far easier to contact somebody from a business than it is to contact a public school counselor because public school counselors often can't speak in the public news, right? Because of re restrictions by the department, right? You know, I got this ad on Instagram, right? And it's like, this dude has the magic to get us into that. And of course he's selling something, right? Oh, your student didn't get in with a perfect GPA. I have the magic to solve it for you, right? So, so be aware of sort of what these, what the stories are and what your families are seeing and how you're going to have to combat that, right? Um, John, he's a great person. If you're on social media, if you read blogs, his blog is one you have to pay attention to. Um, he's, you know, he's one of the people who, who does, he, he is data driven and really transparent about how these things work, right? And I thought this was a great quote is that basically so much of the anxiety in this process is driven by people trying to say they know the secret sauce. And I think when you come, when you add this comment to institutions are often motivated by institutional priorities, right? They got their own stuff they got to put out there. They have their own things that have to be handled. They need X number of athletes. They need X number of people for the English department as well as for the engineering department. So maybe the admissions decision is driven by you applying to engineering instead of English. So there are lots of institutional priorities that change the game and change the conversation. Right. So just be aware that research, media, all of this stuff, uh, you know, who's doing it? What does it mean? You know, uh, ACT coming out and saying test optional doesn't benefit universities. I'm going I'm to I'm question that. This book that was making the rounds a while ago about measuring success floored me when I looked at the, the acknowledgments in the book. Just look at the highlighted part. Look at the word before it also. So they thanked our communications team. All those people work at the college board. So this research driven book, the research that says testing is better because grades are inflated. In their acknowledgements, they thanked college board's marketing team and they called it our communications team. Oh yeah, this book ain't, ain't, ain't you know, doesn't have a particular point of view they're trying to push, right? Who benefits from this? This benefits the, you know, that benefits the test, test takers, I mean, the test makers, right? So be aware, right? Share that information, let folks know, you know, lower test scores, I'm not sure what that means. There, are, there is meaning to test scores. The problem is the commodification of test scores reduces the meaning that they actually have, right? Um, this is UW's recent announcement, right? And I thought it was interesting because they're, they're very transparent about kind of what they're doing, right? The technically test optional. I just, I just love that they said, we are technically test optional. But essentially they're saying, we don't look at scores until like the very, very end, maybe for a handful of students, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like to me, this feels like no one allowed them, whoever was in charge of things politically did not allow them to be test blind and they kind of wanted to. So they are effectively test blind, except they can't really say that because somebody's in, you know, somebody pulling the strings like, nah, I'm not gonna let you do that, right? So. I'm sure Michigan and Georgetown will say very different things on their website. So yes, in truth, test optional is not equal at all places, right? As a general guideline, as a counselor, what I would look at is if they were test optional before the pandemic, then they absolutely have taken a philosophical stance around letting students submit and their process will not disadvantage students in any way. If they were test optional simply because of the pandemic, I have a few more questions, right? Um, and so that's that's sort of how I look at it. So question of whether it's, you know, SAT and ACT are going away forever? No, right? Just like, you know, 
the undead never die. Something's just never gonna go away. You can't kill the roaches no matter how much you spray. That's kind of how I feel like the SAT. Like it, it, it's the roach, like we gonna spray and spray and spray. We gonna bomb the house, it ain't gonna go away. You know, it's gonna be designed, it's gonna live on. Uh, but what's gonna change is how it's used, the weight it carries, all of those. So I'm thinking about, you know, and, and this is also some, Right. The, there's a study recently that, that asked colleges, are you going to be test blind, be test optional? What's going to happen next? And if you kind of just look at this, essentially, most schools said they're not likely to require to, you know, that they're going to stay test optional. The vast majority of schools are going to either become or stay test optional. So this is, I'm charging them one at a time because, because, yeah. <laughs> I guess I forgot to charge him last night. Shut up. Leave me alone. Why are you going to call me out? <laughs> right. Right. What was fun about this research is it came from ACT, right? So ACT's research, which I would have expected to, you know, do everything they can to say, nah, test optional is going away. ACT in and of itself came out with studies like, yes, test optional is here to stay, right? So think about the advice, thinking about how all of this gets framed, thinking about what this means, thinking about the messaging to your students. Right. I feel that one of the things that you have to do is undermine the messaging of testing equating to preparedness for college. I hate that messaging. I don't think it's valid. Testing does tell us some stuff, but does it tell us whether you're prepared for college or not? I don't think so. I think testing is like using lacrosse to judge athleticism. Lacrosse is a sport. It does require athletics. But if I use lacrosse to judge athleticism, some sports will translate better. Some sports you know, baseball, sure, hand-eye coordination, running, like, so it's very similar to lacrosse in terms of the skills required. Some sports won't translate as well, right? So testing measures performance in a particular set of skills, right? It does not measure your ability to do well in college. And even the research around benchmarking from the testing companies tells us that, right? I mean, you've all heard of that college benchmark number. This is the number 18 in the English says that you have a probability of getting a 75% or better, a 75 or better in a 75% probability or of getting a C or higher in a college level English class. That's what an 18 on the SAT tells you on the ACT, except what they don't tell you is the full research is this chart on the right. So what's on the, on, sorry, what's on the left is what they put on the score report for students. What's on the right is the full research that led to the comment on the left. So they've chosen one particular point to talk about. Why did they choose to talk about 75%? What I looked at was the bottom. 10%, a 10 on the ACT, which is less than random guessing, correlates to about a 60% chance of getting a C or better. Well, hell. So what the hell is the ACT telling me then? If I, have a, if I guess randomly on the ACT, I have a 60% chance of getting a, a, a C or better. <laughs> I'm not sure what the test is telling me, right? Because C's get degrees. So if a kid's got 60% chance of, of passing his college classes, cool, let's let him in, right? But of course, ACT don't want that 10 number out there. They don't want to tell you 10 means college ready, right? So now I will say there is a difference between somebody who does all the work and gets a 10 and somebody who does all the work on the test and gets a, a 25, they probably know different stuff. But is it as different as they're trying to make us believe, right? That's the question. I think that colleges, college board, ACT, want us to think that a good ACT score is like finding the strong person. They want us to believe we are looking for that academically, uh, that academic Adonis, right? So testing means we found this dude, but in truth, testing is creating this dude, right? Testing is, is a warped metric that may not actually convey the strength that we're saying it conveys, right? The bodybuilders aren't the strongest ones, right? And testing is creating these dudes. It's creating warped incentives and warped outcomes by focusing solely on this one warped metric, right? So we have to be aware of kind of what this is doing. It's ignoring that this dude held the record for strongest man for like 30 odd years, right? But he's not the one we perceive to be strong. It ignores all of these people, right? 
Simone Biles can kick my ass every day, all day. We know this. <laughs> like, there is just no question that she is stronger than most of us in this room, right? But in focusing on the appearance of strength, they are ignoring the reality of strength and the reality that the strongest man often doesn't have that appearance of strength. The strongest student may not perform well on that three hour Saturday testing only English and math in very particular ways that can be gamed and steroided to a better perception of strength. So we have to be aware of that. And I say in the, the you know, those bodybuilders ain't strong. They are also stronger than me, right? but it's a very different kind of strength. So just be aware of kind of all of these things, right? And be aware of what this stuff means, right? Uh, so I'm gonna sort of wrap up here. I'm gonna jump past a couple of things, right? The narratives of finding the diamond in a rough is, is not quite legit, right? Um, there's data from ACT. This was an ACT study that showed that when they looked at GPA versus test score, 85% of students had aligned GPAs and test scores. Only 9% had what they called a discrepant ACT score. So the ACT score is much higher than their GPA would have indicated. Or 5% had a much higher GPA than their test score would have indicated. So basically test score tells us nothing new for the vast majority of students, right? And if you look at kind of that data played out differently, it's like, yeah, test scores and GPA tend to be lockstep aligned. So all this, shenanigans around test scores and saying like test scores are going to miraculously discover eh, it's a really small population that actually has discrepant test scores in gpa right uh and this is the same basic study from act again noticing that a really small population have discrepant test scores in gpa right slightly bigger on the sat than on the act but when we break down who has better test scores those with better test scores are largely male largely white largely wealthy and largely from college educated parents. So again, who is the test benefiting? It's not finding the underrepresented first gen student. Um, you know, I thought we were going to 11. If y'all got questions, just throw them in there. I thought we were going to 11. So I was giving us about half an hour for questions. Um, my bad if I'm going long. Y'all got questions, throw them in there. I am very happy to kind of chill. I'm wrapping it up anyway. Uh, no, um, uh, Keel, you are correct. We are going to 11. We are also um, going to take, uh, please form your questions, folks, because I know you got a thousand because I have more than I even know how to form in my head right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but we do leave a little bit of time for questions for you, but also announcements at the end. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm, I'm about two minutes out, I hope. I think. Okay. Um, it's big right, things, great. right? Things vary across states in terms of test optional and how many colleges are test optional. So make sure you're checking into that, making sure you look at that. I have students think about a grid like this. If I'm talking to students, I want them looking at admissions, scholarships, and honors. Because if this is the student's list of colleges, starting with St. Mary's, which yesterday announced that they are test free for all the things, they are not looking at test scores, um, right? But if this student is looking at schools, right, then if we throw University of Georgia into the mix, now they have to test. If their list doesn't include University of Georgia, they're pretty good, right? They may not have to test at all. And if testing ain't their thing, don't do it. But if you throw Georgia into the mix, now they do have to test. So make sure that you're kind of looking at that across things. And then, as a, again, I might have to look at this across different uses or misuses of tests. Some colleges are using and some high schools are using it for admissions into dual enrollment, which to me is crazy, right? The point of dual enrollment is to get ahead. Why would I require the SAT scores to let somebody do dual enrollment? But some places are doing that, right? Some places are using test scores in kind of crazy ways in placement and in, and in credit. Like Auburn here is driving me crazy with it, with their thing. Like if you look down, right, where is it? Um, here we go. The second bullet there, SAT taken, no, the last one, SAT taken after March 16th, right? They're using reading to give credit. They're using reading, not English, because the SAT has a grammar component. But the University of Auburn is using the reading score, not the English score, to award credit for an English composition class. But they're using the English from the ACT. 
the English from the ACT and the grammar from the SAT are the exact same test. But I don't know what the hell Auburn is doing. And the distinction between getting, like, if you go from a 37 to a 38 on that, Eng on that reading SAT score, you get six credits instead of three. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So be aware of what the colleges around you may be doing with the test in addition to admissions, because sometimes that's important, right? And then the final thing I'll say, data is coming out these days on how many people were admitted with scores and not, right? 18% of the admitted students, of the people who submitted score at Emory got in, only 8% of those who did not submit scores to Emory got in. What this data has universally excluded is other factors. If we know test scores and GPA are fundamentally lockstep, then we should probably assume that those with lower test scores probably often have lower GPAs as well. So by disaggregating it solely by GPA, uh, by test scores, you're not actually telling the full story. So just be careful about how much people glom onto these messages right? Because it's not complete story and it's not entirely true at all. So big things to walk away with testing and advice I would give, only test if it's safe. If you're in California and COVID is still rampant, I'm not going into a room with 25 kids to take a test. If you're in a place where they get rid of mass mandates and there's still a high level of, of COVID positivity, why would you go into a room, right? So take it if it's safe, take it if it's necessary, your universities require it, take it if it's helpful, I'm a real good test taker. I took the PSAT and I got a crazy good score. Okay, it might be helpful to you. Maybe I'll take it, right? So I think those are the sort of key points that you want to point out to students around test taking. Um, there's my email. There's my Twitter. If you have questions that I don't get to today, feel free to hit me up in another place. But for now, we'll take some questions. Okay. Rob the mic. Yeah. I think everybody just needs to breathe in through the nose, <laughs> blow out through the mouth. That was amazing and a lot. And so I'm going to need you to come back every month. And oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just no, me. No, it's not. It I have isn't. like eight pages of notes. And, and some okay, of this I heard Akil I say it. already. <laughs> Yo, y'all, y'all pushing us into half the contract with this brother. <laughs> we, can't, we can't get to that yes. That brother is a million dollars worth of knowledge. Oh, that's got heavens, yes. Yes, yes and, yes. and also, let me let me caveat that a little bit, right? So Please. I think that there's a couple of different things I'm trying to process for you guys. And I think you should sort. There is policy philosophy around testing admissions and all that sort of stuff. And then there's the day-to-day -day work. Right, and so I sort of finished up with the day-to-day -day work of what counselors need to tell kids and families, right? I think that's your primary job of most of the folks in the room is the day-to-day -day work. The policy, the philosophy and stuff, I let y'all know about that so when you have conversations, you can support me and you can give more information to families, but I think you should, separate, like you all need to know all of it. Like I'm sure all of y'all know more about colleges in your region than I do. I don't know the difference between Drexel and Swarthmore. I know Drexel got a dragon and Swarthmore. I don't know what their logo is. I don't even know what, I don't even know how big Swarthmore is. Y'all know more about colleges than I do. My job is to think about higher ed policy and testing policy. I don't actually want to know about Swarthmore. Somebody come to me from Philly trying to get into school. I'm sending them to one of y'all because that's not my gig. So just remember like, you know, what's the piece of this that you need to know to do the work? And what's the piece of it that you like to know to be more informed? Right, and I think that'll make this easier to process. It's still a lot. It is still a lot. <laughs> well, but it's, but a, this is, it's a good a lot that way. It's, it's a, good a good a lot. lot. That's what I was gonna say. And this is exactly, I mean, Akil is one of us in that this is precisely, he just nailed what College Prep Roundtable is all about. And so don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to promote us you know, just, you know, take a, a stab to promote College Prep Roundtable, but this is precisely, so we've been disruptors from the very beginning. The, the, the idea of college access and success practitioners wasn't a thing 
passed uh, prior to 1992, except for a little bit of TRIO. So there was no category that you could check off when you wanted to become a member. There was no invitation that went out to college access and success people um, who did this work, for, particularly in urban high schools, um, when you know it was time to uh, get professional development. So we have been disrupting from the very beginning around making sure that you all get this kind of information. Um, and if you know me at all and work with me even a little bit or heard me in these meetings, meetings. I am like a ridiculously um, standing on the soapbox of professional development. Um, and, I, and you've probably heard all of my stories before. Tom has a thousand stories. Nicole has a thousand stories. Janine Wright and I worked together for a very long time trying to pull this together. Nancy is also on our team. We've got all these stories around, you know, how we got to this place to make sure that we understood that our professional development was key to our young people getting what they actually need, not just continuing to repeat the mantras and the, uh, the sound bites that you get on the internet or that you get um, in the media. And so I have to say, thank you, my good brother, Mr. Akil Bello. Can we please give it up for him first <laughs> in a virtual <laughs> clap, in an actual clap? Um, uh, that, that was really uh, impactful. That I'm gonna have to watch that video about four more times before I can uh, <laughs> pull the information together. Um, what I do wanna do is without delay, I do wanna make sure that you all are getting your questions answered because this is a, a, a gentleman who has taken out his time to be with us today. And I really wanna make sure that you all understand. I do wanna start us off with one thing though. Akil, you dropped a whole lot of information in your presentation, some references and resources that you recommended. Um, what's the best way to get access to some of the resources that you recommended? It should, I mean, and so in part of, on the slides, what I probably, what I usually try to put is a screenshot of the title. Usually Googling the title in quotes will get you there right away. Almost everything is a quick Google away. If it's not, then just let me know because if it's not a quick Google for you, it's probably a quick Google for me, right? Um, that's usually what I do. Um, some of it, I'll probably send a PDF of the slides because um, the, the slides themselves are a lot. Just an, It's a huge file. Um, but if you can't find anything, just, just shoot me an email. That'll be easy enough. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, so we'll work it out with the kill everybody because yeah, it's come from a few folks they want if they could get the slides. So we'll do that. We will definitely make sure that this video, however, or the, the video of the recording of the meeting will, will be out to you over the next few days. Another good way to get access to stuff like this is if you are on Twitter, I find Twitter better than Instagram. I hate Instagram. I don't really do nothing but Instagram except post food that my children bake. Um, so you know, I ain't an Instagram person. I find Twitter is much more useful for actual information. Instagram is where you go to see pretty vain people. Um, Twitter is where you go to see academics fight it out. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter, you will usually find something very similar in terms of shenanigans mixed with research, but usually on Twitter, I'll link to research more often. And you'll find the other people to follow, like John Bakkenstad and folks who put out really good information. That's that's good to know. Excellent. Um, your uh, well, let me open it up because I'm not seeing. If you have a question, just take yourself off of mic, or if you'd like to drop it in the chat, we'll monitor the chat. Um, uh, I also... wanted to pull up um, Shamik's questions, even though. Akil spoke to uh, some of it. I just wanted to read it out the way Shamik um, put in the chat because he had to leave. Um, one is how are successfully, successively smaller high school senior graduating classes being engaged in the college admissions process? And how are 
Second, how are increasingly diverse senior graduating classes be engaged in the college access, in the college admissions process? That's on y'all. That's not on me. I don't work. I don't work. I don't do college counseling. I, yeah, I, was I am aware say, of like college counseling. I don't do it. Call, like how they're doing but it. But yeah. what are you aware? I mean, I know, I know this is not your, you know, you're not boots on the ground in terms of, of college counseling. But have you have you heard at your level any trends around what people are doing, if people are doing anything that's being heard or seen anywhere? I think it's the same. I don't think college counseling has really changed, right? I think what's changed is the attention to the need for college counseling, okay. right? So organizations have formed around college counseling. College counselors are more informed and doing work, but you still have the issue of ratios, right? So I think that's the big conversation isn't like, how is the work happening? It's just that the ratios are so troubling that we got to get more counselors on the ground. Um, the, you know, I think the diversity is an interesting question because it's a question of the diversity of the population, right? If you have, you know, a largely uh, Latinx population, is the counselor aware of, of Hispanic serving institutions, right? Did you know what all those acronyms meant when I did that slide with the microphones, MSI, HSI, you know, and Celsius. so I think mm -hmm. that's the big question is what's the level of awareness of different types of institutions the value of attending different institutions. When you look at social mobility, it's almost always the publics that win, right? It's almost all like CUNY rises to the top of social mobility. The, the, um, the California university system rises to the top of social mobility. Florida, as, as horrible as Florida is for most things education, Florida's public system does a really good job enrolling Pell kids. So, you know, I think part of it is, is awareness of different institutions, what value they offer. You know, if you've ever put Elon on a list for a black student, but haven't put a HBCU, you need to check yourself. Elon is 97% white, right? How am I gonna send a black kid to Elon in North Carolina, I believe, which is 90% white, but don't put a HBCU on their list, right? That says something. So I think one of the things that changed in this conversation is getting past the rankings, right? Getting past rankings and popularity in this conversation to have more meaningful discussions. Um, and then we sort of swing the other way with the whole undermatching conversation that, that has sort of some negative outcomes. Um, you know, I think you keep seeing, like if you're part of the college group, the CAC group and Facebook, um, every year there's, there's the folks getting mad because some black kid applied to eight IVs and like, oh my God, and this year, you know, Melissa Korn from the Wall Street Journal just posted uh, some article about some black kid who applied to 80 colleges, right? And got into 59. She's like, what's he doing? It's madness. I'm like, so what? It's like four applications. You do the common app, you do the, the common HBCU app, you do your state app, guess what? You click all the schools, you got 80 applications right there with three, we're like, it ain't no work. Right? So like, why are you mad? Right, so, and I think it's, it's, it's getting into those conversations and making sure those things don't happen. The other thing I think that's become big in sort of the college counseling world is, is school, um, school profiles and making sure school profiles are useful, up to date, especially at newer, smaller schools because colleges don't know them as well. So the job of the counselor to increase awareness of what the school is in the college office is also important. Oh, Tom's got his hand up. Recognizing Mr. Thank, Butler. Thank you, Nolan. Yeah, hey, welcome, Akil, yeah. there, <laughs> Akil, is there any reason why, or or and it may not have hit your lens, right? Because you you're the big national guy, international guy. But is there any reason why there's and there was a lot of states that wasn't referenced, but is there any reason why Pennsylvania and I so not just you, but another place with Pennsylvania? from the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, which is our public college university system, um, our community college systems. Is there any reason why we're not popping up places and talking? Is that because we're kind of like in the middle mediocre or what, or is it just that we just don't have enough stuff going on here to, to become speakable from a national level? That's a good question. I have no idea. 
I don't normally think about Pennsylvania. You're right. I think we think about you, Penn, and Sandusky, right? Like, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, right? so, I'm, <laughs> like, literally, that's my thoughts on Pennsylvania. Every now and again, I think about Swarthmore because I follow Dr. Andrew Moe, who runs their admissions office on Twitter, and he's doing great things around rural students and stuff like that, right? I do remember seeing the thing about them trying to collapse the the, UP, the Pennsylvania system. I saw something, right? But I don't really know much about the Pennsylvania system, and I don't know why. Um, I do know that, you know, like, I, I noticed you said mediocre, right? And I want to push back on that, but I don't know enough to push back on it, right? I do know that a lot of times those judgments are popularity, not education. Right. So I think we have to dig into those sort of things. And y'all could do something about that. Make sure Pennsylvania is always popping. You just did something about that. You got me thinking about Pennsylvania now. I'm going to go and I'm going to learn a little something about Pennsylvania. If I, I didn't I put this presentation to together that, last night, or I would have I I actually put yeah, more I, Pennsylvania I don't stuff. I know in if there. we want to do that either. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you know, because I have to say, Pennsylvania is on joke time in, in a lot of educational circles in terms of funding it, um, being, you know, leading on how people get into places, assisting. So I don't know how much you really want to know. It, sometimes it's political, right? And that's, that's part of what happens in a lot of places when politics control the educational decisions, weird things happen, right? And so that, but I think what your job is what the role that you guys can play is sort of doing both, right? Making me and folks who are sort of speaking about policy and things like that aware of Pennsylvania needs more shine and then I can dig into it, right? Then I'll think about digging into it. While at the same time, working with your students to ensure that they are aware of the opportunities in Pennsylvania. It's funny, I'm sitting here right now thinking, where is Temple? Is Temple in Pennsylvania? Because I love Temple. Temple's in Pennsylvania, right? Really? <laughs> so like, it's like, That's I love really. Temple in that, in that Pennsylvania. So, so yeah, yeah like, they're the other HBCU. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right. So, I mean, part of it is I make intentional decisions around, if I'm talking to a reporter, I'm like, I'm going to say this school's name and that school's name, but not that school's name. I will almost never in public say Stanford. Like all of those, I actually usually say Stanford and just call them all the same thing. I ain't mentioning them by name. So part of that could be the intentionality around what do I discuss and who is my example schools? My example schools aren't accidental, right? Um, so I think part of that is the conversation you wanna make sure you have. Somebody asked a question in the chat that I just noticed that I wanted to address um, about test prep. Uh, where was it? Yeah, Akil, that was, that was my question. We spend a lot of time on test prep in our programs. And I'm just wondering, like, based on the, um, you know, all the information that you shared and the different areas in which testing might still be necessary in the future, but maybe for particular students interested in particular schools or opportunities, where do you, where do you think about sort of the time that's spent on test prep? I think you, I think you still have to do it. I think that, well... Let me, let me say that slightly better. Looking at the students you work with and the schools they apply to, if they are applying to Georgetown and UPenn and Michigan, there is no question you are doing test prep. If they are applying to Temple, Rutgers, I feel like Temple's been test optional for a while, right? They're applying to Temple and that's the number one and Rutgers, I feel like they are test optional. I don't remember all the ones, right? But if they're applying to like, all these schools with histories of test optional, and that's the number one, maybe we roll that back and put that money somewhere else, right? In my perfect world, so it's funny, my full-time job to work at, at fair tests, right, and to argue for more limited, more reasonable use of testing is actually in conflict with my more lucrative part-time job as a highly paid SAT tutor. I would like to stop my part-time job being viable. Right? Like if, if, if I had a perfect world, I, there would be no opportunity for me to tutor. I don't see that happening immediately, right? So I still see that there are going to be places that look at tests, require tests, that it will be useful for some kids to make sure they're sending their best results. 
as long as that's a real conversation, as long as that's the truth, then I'm then I'm going to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You just got to be careful about who you do it with and what messages they convey. I you just took the I'm just going to let you go because I just came off a of mic to say that. So I'm going to book back on mute. <laughs> I mean, the problem I have with a lot of this is like, like I do test prep for a living, right? Like, I mean, that, that supplements my income, but I'm quick to tell you, like, yeah, it sucks. Like, like this ain't a real thing. This is the steroids of education, right? Like many people in this industry won't come out and say that because that might convince you, Juliet, to, to, to not hire me, right? That might convince you to like not do test prep. Well, I'd rather you not do test prep than do pointless test prep. If all your kids are applying to Temple, like, come on. And like, you know, maybe if Temple uses it in merit scholarships, I would be more concerned. But if they're all applying to Temple and Temple's gotten rid of it in admissions and merit scholarships, and they've been that way for 10 years, then why am I going to put all that time and effort in that when it has a marginal value in terms of getting them into school? So. Other questions? Akil, it's Lisa. Hello. Can you talk a little bit about early action and early decision? And now obviously the media was giving so much pressure on everyone must consider early pools. That's going to be a priority. I haven't seen that data to prove true, but it's parents, true. parents are sucking that up. Can you reflect on that? It's true. It's evil. Um, I hate early. It is a huge advantage. Um, it's also a privilege of the wealthy. So yeah, it sucks. I've, I've seen places where like 50% admission rate in early and 12% admission rate for regular. And they're taking 80% of their kids early, right? So part of that is you have to, again, there's no universal answer to any of this, right? You guys got to know the schools that your kids are applying to broadly like it's impossible to know all the schools right but if you know your top 10 schools and their predilections and things like that then you have a good start and you know the questions to tell the students and families to ask about the other schools that you don't know as well right but you need to you know that's one of the things i would definitely say you got to disaggregate if they do early you got to find their data on early and ipads requires them to report this so this is there somewhere um one of the places i would get information i love compress prep um, a test prep company run by a friend of mine, Adam Ingersoll, they have a, a guide to testing or something like that. Phenomenal. And they do a really good job of two things. One, being fair and disaggregating data. And two, fessing up to their privilege. They're like, we look at 400 schools. That's it. Right. So like, they, they like so you're not going to find Fisk on there. Right. Because they're like, we look at these 400 schools because guess what? We're a test prep company. Therefore, the people we're talking to have a certain amount of wealth and are looking at a certain subset of schools. I think they're very honest about that, which I actually like, right? They don't call it college. They call it these 400 we like, right? So I think that that's that. So I like them for all of those things. And their, their guide is downloadable and it's, it's detailed and it's right. So you say it was Compass, right? Compass, yeah, C-O-M-P-A-S-S. -S. So I, I would look at their information. Um, I also would take advantage of all the other folks that are out there. College Wise does a lot of free crap, and I like College Wise. Again, I find them fair and thoughtful. You know, anybody with Ivy in their name, they can kiss my butt. Um, you know, because it just tells you what their focus is. Crimson education, you know, trees, vegetation like, on the walls, it. huh? <laughs> Ivy, vegetation right. on the wall. Right. I was like, like, nah. I'm looking at your your background, Lisa. I love Andy Morse at, at in Illinois, right? He's another person I would follow on Twitter. Lots of great information. So I think you, you've got to find the people who will give thoughtful, disaggregated information that's actually relevant to the students you work with. Now, if you work with families that have $250,000 a year and they got you know a million dollars socked away for college, that means you should probably be looking at a different subset of folks. Right. So, you know, and if, you know, if it's Harvard or die your whole crowd, that's a different group with a different focus on colleges. So I think we have to think about who are you serving 
um, and what does that mean to what your advice becomes. And Akil, can you go on the road with every president and get them to stop submitting information to U.S. News? If I could make that happen, man. Good luck with that. I would, I would love to make that happen. Yeah, that, that one, that one, that would, that would be a thing that would make me very happy. U.S. News is kind of the worst of the worst. I've got one question in the chat that I want to try to get in. Um, Arvia Hall asks, as there are times I attempt to encourage my students to attend HBCUs, they often face the higher test score challenge that some of them are now requiring. Do you feel they are jumping on board as they feel they must, quote, keep up, unquote, or what do you feel is motivating factor for some of our more well-known HBCUs, I won't name any, to require increasingly higher scores? I don't know a single college that requires scores. There's a de facto requirement in who they accept, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not actually requiring scores. They are accepting certain profiles of students and that tells you, and that defines the scores that they accept. So you could actually look at that the other way. They're getting applicants with higher test scores and therefore their accepted pool has higher test scores, right? Got so it. Got it. that's a natural consequence of achieving levels of prestige, right? So I get it. It sucks when your student doesn't get admitted but it kind of says something good for the institutions. I would offer this. Institutions have their own priorities. You can't be aware of the institutional priorities, nor can families. So the question is, is the institution somewhere I am willing to attend? If so, you do the work and you apply. They may or may not accept you depending on the institutional priorities. Right? I think that's what it ultimately comes down to. I'm not saying anybody should go to an HBCU because if Harvard offers you a free ride and Hampton offers you 10K a year that you have to come out of pocket with or take in loans, I'm probably going to Harvard, right? So, you know, so, and, and I think that one of the conversations becomes, you know, there's a, there's a different conversation, applying and willing to go if the financial package works out, right? Or, you know, or, or not applying. And I think most people conflate those two things. I think you apply broadly and see where the financial aid package works out. Um, and you make those decisions when it comes to that. Far too many people I've seen dismiss the category of HBCUs at the front end of the process, right? But, but, but weirdly, they don't do it with NYU. NYU has the same reputation. NYU is known to be one of the worst places ever for financial aid. <laughs> but folks are okay applying there left, right, and center. If you apply there, apply to HBCU. I'm not saying take $40,000 in debt, but I'm saying it's at least worth the application and maybe I will get a package I can handle, right? So I think there's one, that whole conversation of prestige and whatever, the school has whatever scores they have. The worst thing that happens with an application is you get told no. If you don't apply, you get told no anyway, right? So I think that like, if they want to go, you apply and you wait to see what happens on the other end, right? Um, lots of HBCUs are, you know, there there are some like more, uh, not Morehouse, Morgan. I feel like they had eighty percent more applications this year. So are they going to require higher test scores next year? Probably the test scores will probably be higher if the pool had higher scores, right? But I think Morgan was test optional last year. I'm trying to convince Clark to be test optional in the future. Right. It's a tough challenge because, you know, there's a perception of prestige associated with it, right? But now's the moment where a lot of places can make this happen, right? Now's the moment where a lot of places can be test optional and maintain the level of prestige because of the number of institutions that are already doing it. Right, so I think that that's going to be one of the interesting things to see what happens in this moment is how many schools continue to be test optional after this is all said and done. Phew. <laughs> I'm on uh, intake overload. I, I'm just eating up every morsel that is coming out. Um, we are at time, which I know those of you who have hung in, um, are probably willing to sit for another half hour or so. 
but we're going to let Akil actually get something to eat and drink and breathe and <laughs> move on to coffee. his day. I'm good. <laughs> yes, and coffee. Right. Um, once again, though, I have to say uh, thank you. If we could give it up for him one more time. It, thank you. It's absolutely incredible. I'm also going to go out on a limb and say this. If um, and maybe the people who were already left, but if this makes you a little like uncomfortable, where you feel like okay, I have a lot more to learn and a few more things that I have to do, then that's a good thing. Then we accomplish what we needed to accomplish because you do have to take yourself out on that edge. Because if you don't know the things that you need to know, then your kids are going to be lost, um, and that's what we're in the business of doing and making sure. I think that this is food for thought, whether you agree with all of the ideas or not, it's food for thought. Um, and, and I like Akil's approach, which was to go and do some research before you get in the faces of the, of the young people and their families, go do your own research. Um, and that is a big piece of what we're all about. So I have to thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Nancy real quick. Ah, thank you. Um, I really want to thank the committee for uh, helping pull this together. Thanks. And thanks to Akil for sitting with us prior to this <laughs> and the fight over who's president of your fan club. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you to everyone who took the time out to come today. Uh, I just second the whole idea of the fact that there was so much to take in, but this is this is good stuff. This is what PCPR is striving to always do, is to give you more that makes you want more. Um, and this is great information that you can use with your students now. It's a perspective that you can use now that's immediately applicable to the work that you do. And that's what PCPR um, strives to continuously do, is to give you stuff you can take away and use tomorrow. Exactly. with your students. Thank you, Nancy. And Mr. Butler, any famous last words? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, a um, I, I Look, I know folks are over time. We lost, we didn't lose anybody. <laughs> folks had to ch ch sign off yeah. and go to their next mm -hmm. someplace. Uh, Akil, Akil, Akil. Um, you know, when we came on board, when we actually come on board, you have never given us a no yet. Uh, believe me, we're playing poker and we're not going to throw out too many more chips at you to take what we know you are uh, world renowned, uh, always on the move to the next something. Uh, but you are a lifeline for us from a national and international perspective. So we thank you for your time and efforts. I thank everyone who joined also uh, in on this. I also I have to do, again do it while Nancy just said it, but do it from my standpoint and just thank the team, thank um, Nancy for chairing PCPR all this year and last year into meetings. I want to thank Candace for always being, Candace is my ride or die. I'm just going to put it out there like that. I just say, I got a new one every time. That's that it. was the one That's today. It. She's the ride or die from the beginning. Janine Wright, um, I, I consider her a mentor. Um, she's dumped on board with us. And I want you to pay attention to Janine's post in the chat about the FIND K-16 event coming up. Uh, please plan to attend that. We'll get something out in, in, in good steed to the whole organization around that. Jenny, when is the date again? Really fast, really quick. June 3rd. June 3rd. So that's coming up in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Is there a deadline or registration for that event? Uh, there is not. It's open to everybody right now. And uh, go on and check it out. I think you'll be very interested. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And, 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 our, and, our, and our true, like, new bud, but keeps us honest and true, and that's Nicole Mitchell. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Mitchell. <laughs> yes, you, you've been Where did promoted. that honorary come from? That yeah. honorary doctor? You've been promoted. <laughs> you, got it, you got it. Oh, Phil Rankin's Stanvard. I got it from Stanvard. <laughs> Stanvard. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, Stanvard. Well, well, Stanvard. Stanvard. next to Hillman. I'm going to say, say Hillman. <laughs> um, again, I just also want to say this. Uh, I've, I've dropped in the chat numerous times. Two things. One, there will be a meeting next month, June 17th. Put a hold on your calendar. We'll, as soon as we get all the details worked out, 
It will be happening, you'll know, June 17th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Plan, you know, block your calendar. Uh, and then also that, you know, we, you can still become, or you, we want you to become a member of PCPR. We put that link in there as well. If you, if you didn't get the link, just go to the collegepreproundtable.org website. And up in the right-hand corner, it says, become a member, click on that. And we would love to have you on board. Um, Candace, thank you for allowing me to give you that moment. I know you probably got, the, you're gonna have the closing words. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Thank you all, and, and a particular thank you to all of you who are non-PCPR folks who are outside of the Philadelphia region. Thank you all for coming. I know Kiel kind of lured you in. We hope that you will come back again. We're gonna to try to keep, it's gonna be hard to make that mark with, for the Kiel, right? I mean, get other speakers. That's gonna be tough, uh, but but we're gonna we're gonna do that. We're, gonna, we're bringing that level, we're bringing that level all the time of information and professional knowledge to the table. So thank you so much. Candace. Thanks, yeah, Tom. Tom, you said it. That's it. I, I appreciate you. Everybody have a fantastic day. Get out, get some walking in, get some exercise, eat well, stay healthy. <laughs> stay safe. All right, you guys have a good one. All right. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Akil. Thank you take all. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.